first in a series of uh, several lectures here in the Red Room at Parco Santi, brought to you by the School of Architecture. Um, and tonight we have with us Long Ago. So, um, our wonderful dean, we have a whole lot of heads of state here tonight. So, I'd like to thank Liz, wherever Liz is, Liz, Liz and Kate, some Arco Santi folks here, um, and everyone else present. Our president, Chris Lash, is here, um, who's avoiding us. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, well, just. Uh, a debt of gratitude for everyone who helped um, bring this about. And Stephanie Lynn, our dean, will take it from here and introduce our speaker. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> nice. It's a sold out crowd. Thank you for coming. Um, so I am uh, very pleased and honored to be introducing Wanda De La Costa as our much anticipated guest um, tonight. Continuing from the fall, our first programming since, since the schools moved to Arcosanti and Cosanti. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Wanda. Um, as many of you know, we've invited architects, designers, and curators in our fall and spring series to speak to the recurring themes of regional architecture, housing, and expanded discourse. While I originally invited Wanda to speak under the first one, uh, regional architecture, it's of course the case that these themes are overlapping, uh, fuzzy around the edges, and I anticipate that Wanda's lecture will highlight this fuzziness in a, in a unique and meaningful way. Wanda De La Costa, AIA Lead AP, holds a joint position at the Design School at, and the Dell Webb School of Construction at ASU, um, as well as the honor of being a senior global future scientist with the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at GIOS. She's the founder of the Indigenous Design Collaborative, a community-driven design and construction program based at ASU. The collaborative's projects range from tribal sustainable housing to urban indigenous placekeeping studies. The, the initiative prioritizes historical understanding, community-driven metrics, indigenous design thinking, technical technological innovation, local vernacular intelligence, holistic system solutions thinking, and collaboration with local practitioners. Wanda is also the founder of Tewau Architecture Collective, a practice based in Phoenix that works on projects across the US and Canada. Tewau uh, specializes in indigenous design and visualization, working directly with First Nations clients and with people interested in incorporating indigenous design principles in their buildings. As a, mem as a member of the Saddle, Saddle Lake Cree Nation, Wanda is the first First Nations woman architect to be licensed in Canada, which is extremely inspiring. In addition to speaking tonight, I'm very excited that Wanda and Tawau will be participating in our school's upcoming inaugural exhibition at Arcosanti, titled Organic. In this exhibition, nine designers will each produce an object that presents their own interpretation of this multifaceted and contested term uh, through the lens of process. Tonight, I look forward to hearing more of Wanda's process through indigenous methodologies one that can ultimately teach us of how we can build architectural thinking alongside new forms of knowledge and responsibility towards each other and, our, and to our land. I want to thank everyone for gathering here tonight and um, point out that we're joined, as Christopher said, by students and faculty of the School of Architecture, um, including our semester students from Kane University, uh, members of the Arcosanti and Cosanti Foundation community, and uh, students from Strathclyde University. So let's give a warm welcome to Vanda de la Costa. Thank you. There are two chairs extra up here. <laughs> Can somebody come please sit, to feel free to grab them and slide them. We don't need to be formal here, we're all good. Yeah, feel free, I, no issue. Come on over. Thank you. 
There you go. Look at someone gets really comfy chairs up here. <laughs> there we go. All right. I have a confession. <laughs> I have been challenging architecture, both its process and its products, for a long time. Pretty much my entire profession, professional career. For those of you that are up there in the years, I was trained in that era of shiny white boxes. Anyone else in that era? Um, it was about the end of the 90s, and it had a great idea, you know. It was inspired by technological innovation, which is great, but it incited this sort of global homogeneity. And during my time in architecture school, I learned to conform, which is what we do in architecture school, despite the fact that it made no sense to me at all. My non-conformist views of architecture came from two places. The first place was growing up very close to my relatives on the satellite Cree Nation. Each holiday and each summer, we would pack grandma's home, 60 relatives in this little 800 square foot house, kids running everywhere, no running water, a double outhouse to serve us all, during the day, we had horses to ride, we had bales of hay to climb, we had old cars that became the set for our land-based theatre productions. We lacked nothing. The other place that skewed my belief in the white boxes was a backpacking adventure, which I discussed during dinner tonight. It was supposed to be a six-month work abroad in Australia. For me, I didn't go home. It turned into a seven-year journey around the world living on a shoestring, working odd jobs, living out of my backpack, uh, and immersing myself in all of the beautiful places that are the biomes of this world. During that time, I saw that I wasn't alone. Many other cultures also didn't fit into the little white box. I saw curves. I saw architecture made of bamboo and boulders. I saw wildly expressive roof lines. I saw bas reliefs which accumulated the living histories of the people who lived in these places. I saw underground caves, which mediated the hot temperatures, endless inspiration, and no white boxes. So what you see on screen are the two mechanisms by which I do my work. On the left is the Indigenous Design Collaborative, which our mission is really, sorry, I'm going to have to look this way, um, is really to prepare what I call preparing the next, the next generation of field ambassadors, field transformation ambassadors, through the power of place design and cultures-based innovation. When I think of the mission of my firm, which I you know, started loosely about 12 years ago or so, but it's transformed kind of wildly over the last couple of years, it's hard to describe what we really do, and so I call it a space of possibility, plurality, relationality, collaboration, spatial agency, and resilience. Our focus at the firm are what you see there on the, on the right-hand side. It's everything from indigenous ways of knowing, to participatory design, to mentorship, and to earth-centric design. So today, what I want to talk about are a few things. Well, three things in particular. I want to first define what Indigenous architecture is, and then I want to share with you what I'm noticing in the field. You know, I kind of felt like a bit of an outcast in this profession for a lot of years. I don't feel like that anymore. And I think it's because the field is transforming in the last, I would say, in the, about the last decade. And so I see signs that the, that the field is in flux, and I'm really interested in this. And la third, I want to discuss a few of our projects while I'm going to revive an old theory, cultural sustainability theory in architecture. I don't know if this is even passing through you know, the realms right now in architecture schools, but it was the one thing that actually allows me to connect what we do at our firm with the theory of contemporary architecture. So it's been really, really um, valuable to me. And then the last thing I want to share with you um, a method that I use to think through, which I call productive disruption, because I think sometimes we need to poke, poke the beast, poke, and you know, set our sights on other things that we think this profession could examine. So I will talk in that section about retooling, 
re-aggregating and reframing, basically rethinking how we do architecture. My lens is very niche, it's very small. It's an indigenous perspective, but I think when I look at all the other fringe pursuits that are emerging in our field of architecture right now, I think together they will fuel the transformation that will contribute to more understanding, more inclusiveness and more accuracy in the field. So for those of you that are also interrogating other spaces, I hope to confirm that the field is in flux while sharing a method for disruption and an old new language for interrogating. So let's see what architecture is. So this was, I've got two definitions and I brought one, it's from the same author. He's an uh, indigenous New Zealand Maori urban planner and he created a definition of architecture about five years ago and then he renovated that definition five years later. So this is the first one and it's beautiful because it talks about things that I think we should all think about, you know, natural resources and value systems and knowledges and um, construction methods and you know but he makes a couple of points that it's not just something in the past it's something that can blend the old and the new and he talks about this notion in the third bullet point about the ever-evolving nature of this practice and I think that's really important because I think for us this is really what it's about is that we're we want it to evolve but we're not quite sure what it wants to be if it identifies with indigenous people and by the way, I am a member of the Satellite Cree Nation in northern Alberta, uh, Canada. So this is the definition that he gave to us five or six years later. And he, to me, when people ask me, can anyone do indigenous architecture? Now they can, because he gave us a formula on what it entails and what it is required. And so if you go through there, and this is the definition that we are now testing our work against. It's, it's not easy to meet all seven criteria. You know, you have to connect to the genealogy, connect to the archetype. You know, it might be a teepee or a hogan. What do you do with that? I mean, you know, so it's the eternal challenge of how you bring a contemporary view to some of these old archetypes. But it's also important because it identifies that it's about needs, which is number three. It's about value systems, which is number four. It's about place-based narratives, number five. It's about cosmology. Whenever do we study cosmology? And then it's a, a, an ascribed indigenous meaning. So I think I tell people that I think, you know, if you want to create indigenous architecture, maybe you get three of these or two of these, and maybe it's indigenous design light. If you get all seven, you're in indigenous design. So I think this is a beautiful thing because it, it opened up, I think, the field for anyone to join. So let's talk about um, how I think the field is changing. I don't know if it happened out here, but at ASU, and I think it happened across the country, there was a group of students which um, reacted very negatively to what they were being taught at architecture schools. They called themselves the Design Justice Initiative. And they were upset. They thought that um, the curriculum was outdated, the people who were teaching could be more diverse. They basically sent a letter to the administration saying, if you don't fix this, we're going to the press. And it, this happened at multiple other universities across North America. And so I think this was a sign to come. What you see on the right is this quote saying that the post-millennial generation is already the most racially and ethnically diverse generation in history. And the lower quote says, yet the profession of architecture is not representative and becomes more male and more white as experience levels increase. So I went and did some research, and I thought, is that really true? Is that really what's happening? And it's like 72%, which is, I guess, not quite representative, but it definitely tells a story that we have a bit of work to do for the, you know, who is teaching architecture, because what you teach from is from your personal lived experience. And if you come from a certain lived experience, you're going to teach in a certain way. However, there are glimmers of hope, and what I see emerging right now, there's all of these cohorts that are emerging just in my weird little niche of Indigenous design. All across North America, and it started with uh, UNM in 2011. It was followed by Laurentian University in 2013. We came after in 2016, and now Harvard has a group of Indigenous students that are pushing on these topics. So I have a lot of hope that um, in 10 years, in 20 years, we're going to have a very different field that we're in now. 
So I also know that when I start to look out at the you know, national and international, there is something happening a little bit different. I call it global ethnoscapes, but does any, is anyone familiar with the first picture on the left? Freddie Mamani? Yeah. <laughs> it does, does it look like what we teach in architecture school? Is it right? This guy has a waiting list out the door. He's an indigenous artist turned builder architect. There's a waiting list of years to get um, to buy his architecture. In the middle, New Zealand, um, has anyone heard of the Te Aranga, the Maori indigenous principles that guide the city of Auckland into creating a new way of building cities? And so what they're producing is something extremely unique. And lastly, I went. I was invited to Hawaii. They were worried about, you know, there's a lot of things happening there, the, the degradation of their land, and they're losing their culture, and they don't know how to resuscitate their culture. It's being kind of swallowed up, and so they invited us out there to do a placekeeping study. And I see seeds in there. They took us into a space. You take your shoes off, and you walk on the turf to connect you with Mother Earth. So really, you know, small movements, but I, I think something is happening up there. So I'm going to take you through the theory of cultural sustainability theory. And again, you know, this has really kind of reset, you know, and it reminded me that I do belong in the field of architecture because there are other people out there that sort of see the, the world the way we're seeing it. But I don't know if any of you have read a paper where it just sort of transforms the way you think or saw something that you just flip. This was the thing that flipped for me. And it was, the paper was called Redefining Architecture to Accommodate Cultural Difference, Designing for Cultural Sustainability. And it was Memmott and Kathy Keyes, Paul Memmott and Kathy Keyes who wrote the paper. And it's really about an architecture that's sensitive to and encompassing of cultural contexts, values, that are not overly dominated by the Western concept of what architecture is, including what high architecture is, you know, coming from sort of the Euro traditions. And they're... Their work is just absolutely, um, I think, deeply connected. And they have seven principles. And so I'm going to share my work through their seven principles. And I think it's more interesting than just talking about work. So their first principle says that spatial behavior is culturally specific. The use of space is influenced by our cultural background. This is a justice center. And many of you who, who have designed a justice center or have understood um, traditional principles. The indigenous way is more about um, restorative justice, where you're not kind of criminalizing and kind of, you know, adding, um, adding um, pain to already pain within these folks. It's about restoring. And so the inside is, was all about a garden. It was all about connecting with nature. It was all about socialization spaces. And it was all about really welcoming another way of looking at um, what a justice center could be. Number two, human needs, I'm just reading the small quote below, human needs and environmental attributes are complex and if aligned well, lead to increasingly complementary functionality. What you see on screen is the design that we did to cover up the colonial building that we were given to renovate. <laughs> there are three indigenous architects. We won the schematic design project and then we cried tears when what they tasked us with. How, can, what, how are we supposed to create indigenous architecture from this building? It was seriously, but once we you know, dried the tears and we got to work, thankfully the building was failing, you know, the mechanical systems and the wall systems, and it was very old, and we thought, let's just wrap it up. And we can save it. And half the, de half the design team said, let's, let's knock it down. And I said, no, let's keep it in a container and hold it and remember this moment of time and keep it almost like a, a you know, the message in the bottle that <laughs> could live on forever. But talking about functionality, you know, we gather as Indigenous people. It's one of the main things that we do. We powwow and we do sharing circles and, you know, we feast and it's always about coming together and it's a, there's this sort of social energy that we love to create, filled with traditions. So we just built all these gathering spaces in there. And I think one of the best parts of this project was one of the, we had an elder on our team and we paid her the same amount per hour that we were getting paid because we realized that her knowledge was more valuable than our knowledge. We should have actually paid her more than we were getting. So she was quite happy to show up and come with us wherever we wanted to take her. But she reminded us, she said, well, what about the people that are not in suits? What are they going to do in this facility? 
She said, we need a soup kitchen. I was like, all right, let's, let's bring a soup kitchen into this downtown center. So there's a functionality aspect that is just a little different with our, the thinking. So the third in cultural sustainability theory has to do with architectural meaning. And I love this so much because it almost also created a formula for us. And it says, there are ideological, social, and behavioral meanings that need to be understood, including high-level meanings such as worldview, mid-level meanings such as identity, and low-level meanings such as use. This is kind of the trifecta that I feel like I've been searching for for a long time, worldview, use, and identity. Right? These are three big things. And so what you see on the screen, they asked, they saw the apple, you know, the circular donut, apple, is it apple or Google? I can't remember. They did that big donut <laughs> building. They found that, they said, we love that, but we want it indigenized. And we're like, okay. And then I realized why they loved it. It was because you can gather in the inside of that building safely. The kids can play, they can have gatherings. It creates a really beautiful space for the community. But the, in terms of, so the identity piece is there, the use piece is there, but then in terms of the worldview, they said, can you create um, the 13 moons as the central diagram in the center of that? And I was like, what is the 13 moons? We learn every time we do a project. It's like brand new all over again. And so we created these inscriptions and then they're written um, on all of the benches going around. And it's to teach the youth that come into that space to remind them, remind them of the value systems connected to their worldview. Number four in cultural sustainability theory. Exogenous or outside design decision-making can undermine or reinforce cultural systems. So this is a school, an elementary school, that it's just going into construction in the next couple of weeks. It doesn't look like the sort of colonial schools that you know were the boarding schools and the residential schools of, of former years, and it's on purpose. We, we do deep engagements, and I'll share with you fully, fully transparent our process of how we get to the point of where these buildings get to, um, and it's through talking with community. And in this case, they said, we don't want any hard corners. We had hard corners. We don't want hallways. We had really long hallways, and it wasn't that, it wasn't that nice, and bad things were happening in those hallways. Can you build us something that's more organic? And we said, sure, we will. We will try. What you see on the outside of that um, building is called syllabics, and that was the, it's a phonetic system of language that was brought by the missionaries in Europe, but we adopted it, and we have we, now we call it spirit markers that we put everywhere, and it just it's phonetic sounds, and every time you rotate them 90 degrees, it's you know we wa wu, so it's very interesting, and so they wanted it all over the building, and I thought yes we can, <laughs> and in the inside of that building, you know talking about outside decision-making or inside decision-making in that courtyard. It's not a typical, um, you know, elementary type school. Totally nature-inspired, um, room for powwows and round dances and indigenous sports. We brought back indigenous sports from back in the day. So really, really all about the way these people use the space. The next project is in Eastern, or in Eastern Canada. And they asked us to create um, or to renovate that drum building you see in the, back, in the far distance. And they said, oh, can you tack on a little outdoor gathering center outside? And I said, well, sure. It kind of seems like a bit of an appendage, but can we really get into a little more ind indigenous design? And we ended up creating this massive um, garden for learning and, and growing plants and traditional knowledges that emerged down into what used to be a very depressing space. And that one is in construction now. But I'll read you what this one says. So number five, cultural constructs of well-being and social design. There are culturally specific understandings of what it means to be well. And so I think this project really connects to the idea of, of what, what wellness means to the university students. And for them, they said it has to do with storytelling, a place for storytelling with a fireplace, not a typical university space. It had to do with um, emulating, I guess, Archetypes from their region, they, they had these, has anyone ever heard of the Palisades where they have these great big tall sticks that sort of run around their encampments? It was for us a form of protection. So we emulated that in the sort of, in the front area and then we put greeting wall, greeting name, greeting um, in all the different indigenous languages of that place. 
And then here, you see in the main drum of the building, we started aligning with solstice and equinox and the four directions and east entrance. And it just makes for almost like a ceremonial space every time you go in there. Number six, and this one we just, um, it's a couple of structures that we did for the a for ASU campus. We were doing how do you indigenize a campus, and that was it. That was the interesting question, because I don't know, for those of you that are first generation, I'm first generation, my, no one from my extended family on either side went to university, so it was a really strange place. Um, very uncomfortable, barely made it through, wanted to quit every three months. <laughs> My mom just kept pushing me back in there. I'm glad she did. Uh, but it was, it was difficult. So we were trying to find ways to welcome and um, increase belonging for students of color, particularly indigenous students. And I thought, well, let's take, make an indigenous greeting wall with all the indigenous greetings from all across uh, Arizona. And we got three graffiti artists, indigenous graffiti artists, to do the calligraphy. Of course, the university was like, oh, it looks a little bit too graffiti-ish. Can you un-graffiti? <laughs> like, okay, we can straighten it up. I don't know. We, we did a little bit to change it up so that they were, they were happy with it. But in the end, I think um, what was most important, this is number six, and it says, impact of decision-making and power structure, structures are key. Architects become member members of cultural groups enculturated within a social value system. So the social value system of the university and the students' value system, we had to find that mediation. Graffiti, you know, is a little bit of a stretch, but all the students there are 18 to 22, they get this. The university administrators didn't quite get it. However, now we just built them a great big table that sits in the sort of indigenous research area. We work with resin and wood a lot because we can, you know, manipulate um, resin into almost anything um, and we can embed almost anything. And so this is the table that we produced and it sits in the library. It's the chairs, there's a lot more comfortable chairs in the library, but when you go in the library, this table is, you can't find a seat on this table. It's just, we lit it up from the bottom and it's become a hangout space in the library. And finally, obviously this is not our uh, architecture, but this one I think is really important because it sort of sums up really what we're trying to do. And I've got a picture there of Chaco Canyon, um, which is a really remarkable, uh, how many of you have been to Chaco Canyon? It's just absolutely remarkable, aligned with the soul, you know, solstice and cosmology, a lot of worldview, a lot of um, spirit in that place. And what this one said is that cultural properties of buildings and places. So places are highly symbolic and culturally specific with cosmological, spiritual, and historical references that become identity markers for group societies and nations. And I think for us, this is really what it comes down to, is that is really what we are trying to do is bring the meaning back to the, the environments that our Indigenous people live in. And now, a lot of our work is urban, because 60% of Indigenous people now live in cities, and that's where most of our work is happening these days. But I think this is, you can still um, put these seven tenets to test in an urban environment as well. So, the last stage, and this is where I'm giving up all of our secrets, so... <laughs> of how we do this work. So um, what I think that this is trying, what I'm really trying to get at with, um, you know, retooling, re-aggregating, reframing, is really to think about how we can just a little bit poke at this. And so what, I've sh what I want to share with you are the three words which I think are really important to sort of stand behind. When we're trying to retool, we're trying to alter something so it's more useful or suitable. We re-aggregate. We bring elements or fragments together in a different way. And then finally, we want to reframe these notions. How do we change the way that people look at something? So our process looks a little bit different than normal. Normally, we're taught this, the black circle in architecture school, you just get right in there, you know, do a little bit of place-based research or, I don't know, some inspiration from something, and you just start designing. We go through um, quite a long process before we actually put pen to paper. The first um, thing that we do is we do a number of place-based design research exercises. So this is before we go into the community. 
we want to kind of get familiar with the lingo and what is important to that community and what they believe in and who they are. And so we put that all in our back pocket. We don't have to talk about it, but we just have it sitting in our back pocket. Climate, history and culture, demographics, it could be meaning and materiality, it could be worldview, it could be their cosmology. And then we start to, and this is my older diagram, I apologize, someone to swap this out, but number four is where we start to bring in, not the client, we actually bring in user groups, we expand our team. So we bring in elders, cultural knowledge brokers, artists, youth, everyone that can help contribute to the subject. We go through a series of community-led teachings, and I, I call it teachings specifically to remind everyone that we are there. It's not me coming in and showing how wonderful I can design. It's me, we have a 90-10 rule where we sit quiet for 90% of the time in the community. It's hard because we're taught to speak, we're taught to promote our ideas, we're taught to communicate, and that's what we want to do when we go. On. And it, in our firm, it's, it's the opposite, where we sit and listen, we're, we're learning how to listen. Um, we do an analysis at the end of this sort of engagement and we're now getting into sort of design visualization with our work where we're, how do we capture all of the massive information that we get within our communities. It's a, it's a lot that we get and only then do we start our design. We create number seven, a series of design drivers which are basically kind of big buckets that sort of drive the, drive the design. And then our final concept is not just a building, I think most importantly, it's a storytelling booklet. You know, these are under-examined and undervalued histories that we're connecting with, and I feel like we need to shout them out to the world. So we create these massive documents that we give to our clients, but then we also um, can share them out as well. And the measurement, number 11, we've started to, um, I guess, approach design from the perspective of uh, science. And how can I actually measure the impact of what I'm putting into the world? And so at the beginning of our process, we create a series of impact measurements, and then we hold ourselves to those. Did we hit them? No, nope, go back. Did we hit it? No, nope, go back. And we go back and forth until we get it right. People ask what we are connecting to when we go into community, and it's hard to describe how many things come out from that engagement. But if you zoom in, I mean, it's everything from the traditional land use to value systems to concepts of land tenure to native science. There are so many things that we are touching when we go into community. So the last section here in this slide is really about the reframing. And so to change the way we look at architecture, I think from an indigenous design point of view, I think for me, when people say, well, what is it, and what, what, is it, what does it mean, and what, you know, what is the purpose of Indigenous design, and why is it different? And I tell people, I think it's bringing three things to the profession. It's bringing new meaning, right, when you connect with a whole different culture. It's bringing new methods. The way we do architecture is very different. And then I think, I hope, it's bringing new responsibilities. And that could be anything from responsibilities to, you know, eco ecological resilience, it could be responsibilities to cultural resilience, but it brings new responsibilities. So, in terms of new meaning, just to clarify what we mean, I think the three big things that for me are coming out of Indigenous design and I think will, you know, be important in the future, are the place-based, it's really like hyper-localized. It's not just like a, oh, you know, let's look at the colors of the desert and, you know, get inspired. It's just so in innately place-based that I think it's really a beautiful way to do architecture. It's also value-based. Do you know Harvard, have you seen the Just City design um, values that the, urban, the urbanists over at Harvard are created? They're starting to design urban environments using value systems. And I was like, wow, we do that in indigenous architecture. Maybe we can bring value systems. So it's one of our exercises when we go into community. We start to test value systems. And then finally, it's more um, broadly based. You know, it's not just about aesthetics and economics, which I find kind of top the shelf when we think about how to do design, but it's about social, cultural, economic, all of those things wrapped together. In terms of methods, I think this is going to be, this is probably the hardest, but it requires a bit of power shifting. It requires this integration of lived experience of the people. It requires mutual learning, remembering that this is not just one-sided. It requires thinking about reciprocity, how we're giving back to our local communities. 
And I think it's transformative. It has the potential. You know, we're working on that. We're working on the sort of measurement aspects, but I think it has the potential to transform. And then finally, in terms of responsibilities, I think um, because Indigenous people have a kinship relationship with nature, I think that um, this sort of um, long-term view of the world, the seven generations worldview, that where we are one with nature and we are part of the plants and the rocks and the trees, it gives you a really new way of looking at the world. And so I think this, to me, you know, how many of you have seen that book, Low Tech, where she, Julia Watson, starts to talk about the, you know, the old, new, the low, high, together. I think this is part of this um, discovery process that she has started to attach to. So with that, thank you so much for listening. And I welcome questions and a conversation. <laughs>
not versed in wigwams and you know all of the structures from that culture so I, I am an outsider over there as well and so again we start by um, going into the community and asking who can we talk to to learn and to understand and they always are so generous and they lead you to the knowledge keepers and the knowledge brokers and it's a slower process you know it's slower than how we would normally collect information you got to kind of bring the tobacco and you know get them to trust you and have a cup of tea and maybe go on a drive or walk about around the community and it take it might take a couple of days but once they trust you and then there's such an openness and so between the people in the community and then our awesome cultural researchers that can go into the archives and find stuff we can usually tap into almost any locale right now. But it, there's such a humility that we all kind of go in realizing that we know nothing. And we just say it straight out that we're learning. And be patient with us. We're going to get things wrong. And we've gotten so many things wrong before. We, <laughs> we've taken wrong precedence, you know, when we were doing our own cultural research. You know, because a lot of the materiality and memory is, is lost. There's a lot of things that have been lost in the last, you know, 150 years with the interruption. And so re rebuilding that is part of this work. And you make mistakes. And uh, us too, <laughs> we're in that group. Uh, we do it with humility. And yeah, nobody seems to mind. Yeah, great question. I'd love to learn, um, hear a little bit more about your pedagogy and how the development of your practice um, at ASU and through the Indigenous Design Collaborative has influenced the way that you teach and how that's changed over time. Also recognizing that you, you went to Sire, you went to the University of Calgary, and, and how did those experiences all kind of factor into the way that you work with students today? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, probably the biggest impact on the work was really um, there's an Anishinaabe saying that is um, returning to ourselves and I think that big journey around the world was about that it was you know if you've ever been by yourself roaming around it's this total freedom because you, you nobody knows you you can be anyone you want to nobody knew you know when I was out there journeying around the world and then all of a sudden people would say oh you're from Canada and they're like oh what nationality are you and I was like oh I'm Native American and people would just be like Oh, tell me more. And I'd be like, really? <laughs> like, nobody cares about us back home. Why is everyone, you know, all the European backpacks and stuff, they were all fascinated with it. And it was, that was, I think, a, a really defining moment because I was like, wait, there's a whole bunch of people really interested in this. Maybe I, I shouldn't discount it. And so the more I traveled and the more people were curious about it, and I thought, wait. And then um, it became, I guess, a kind of a, almost a test of whether I could come back to North America and poke the architecture, you know, and, and to see if I could actually change it so it was a little more open. It's only taken about 25 years. <laughs> I'm kind of just a little bit, you know, push it a little bit inside, but I think that's the biggest factor. And I mean, Cyark, places like Cyark, has anyone gone to Cyark? <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's a very progressive design school, but they, this is the, I tried to find a way to integrate their thinking with my thinking. It was really difficult. It was really difficult, you know, because they, it's very form-based. It's very abstracted, you know. Th there wasn't a lot of patience for the, the, you know, you need patience for this work and time. And so it wasn't that formative. I thought it, I thought it would be more formative, but I learned to conform again there. Yeah. But I think the real, uh, what's also really important is, um, just practicing, you know, every project we do, we learn, and then we learn a little more, and it seems that um, teaching wasn't enough, and I, you know, I thought I could just go into academia and just coast into retirement, and then I was like, okay, <laughs> I need to build some buildings, because I was losing that connection with my community, and when you go into community, you hear what's, what's just hurting them, what, what their issues, where, where their pain points are, and then you can help them, you know, co-ideate solutions and I think that is really where the the magic of this field is happening is really being inside the community with trying to understand yeah thank you we are speaking about community and what do you what do you know and what do you think about our shining 
this project. It's, uh, well, I, yeah, and I have. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, like seven years backpacking, I kind of became a little hippie. Like, <laughs> you know, I was I would, could sleep in airports on floors. I could eat when people leave their food at the table in the restaurant next to me. If they left good food, <laughs> we would take it. Like, I learned to live just gr totally grassroots. And so, um, and then I've, I've always been attracted to, I've lived in a number of communes in India. I used to live in the brewery arts lofts in Los Angeles. I love creative communal living. I think is really just a, such a gift. It is such a gift because you are here, you get to, you know, join with other creative minds and be freed from all of the kind of unnecessary stuff that exists in cities you know you can go back there and you know but i think the really the, the learning is this is where learning happens because you have time you know you have time to just not process everything and just be with this place so i love it here i was here five years ago and yeah keep inviting me because i'll always come <laughs> yeah i will never say no I'm curious if you have a vision of uh, the indigenous people in the urban environment. Like what, you know, how do you see, you know, because I could see, you know, you being in like in a rural area where, you know, you have a, uh, I don't know, I guess, I, I grew up in Mexico and you see a lot more, you know, native people and you're like really proud of where they're from, you see their temples, you see their traditions, the food, the music, blah, blah, blah. Um, museums, you know, you, you have all this culture, but in America, you don't, you know, you, they're like, they exist, but you don't know anything about them. I don't know anything about them, you know, I, you just kind of like see them every once in a while or something. But, um, but, you know, I would love to know more about them. I would like to know their traditions, their food, their culture, um, but, but I just don't know where their place in the city is. Like, yeah, I mean, obviously, they're going to go to the bank the movies or whatever, but what else, like, you know, is Well, I think this is a really, a really good question because why are they invisible in the cities? You know, why? I think we, we as architects and planners and urbanists and, you know, scholars should, should be asking that question, that precise question. And it's something that's kind of spurred this work from the get-go. Right, because when I went overseas and I saw so much and like their culture was just embedded and like I spent a lot of time in Asia, I really fell in love because it was such a deep, a deep and old culture, you know, which is why I also loved Israel, I loved Asia because they have such, there's, they go back generations and generations, but it wasn't interrupted, they're still in there sleeping on, in Thailand on those day beds, you know, the mom's got the kid in the sling and frying up, you know, pad thai, like they, they have so many customs that have stayed with them. And so when I got back into North America and I was like, what happened? Like, what, what if we just kind of pushed it aside and it just disappeared? And so part of my work right now is to really incite that conversation. Why are, why are our cities invisible and what can we do about it? We just got that NEA grant to try and see if we can indigenize Tempe. And I'm also working on a big project up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, just outside of, if anyone snowboards, it's great, go up to Calgary, it's the best mountains ever. Um, but the city of Calgary is also interested in, they're doing a big um, renovation of the performance arts downtown. And they said, let's bring indigenous ways of knowing to the whole, all the performing arts. And I was like, oh, baby, you pick me, I, I need to get that. <laughs> have to do this and we got the project and so now we're on this massive um, push to see what does it mean for indigenous worldview identity and function or use remember the trifecta to come into a city how will that city change and I'm excited to find out because I think they should have visibility you know otherwise our cities are all going to look like a big beige homogenous <laughs> white box or whatever <laughs> This is a good. This is a great question. Well, normally you don't have to cover it up like what we had to do. <laughs> I don't think that's necessary. But I think if you know to describe it with some of the contemporary movements, probably biophilia, 
Um, regenerative, regenerative design um, is closely aligned. Um, but then I think there's also a, a, um, a social connection. You know, I think indigenous worldview is really about you, the connection with all living things. So what does it mean for us to connect with humans, with our four-legged, our two-legged, our plants, our animals, um, you know, the biomes that exist in this world? What, are, what would our world look like? And one of the things we're, we're um, poking at right now is, how many of you have heard of indigenous futurity? Or Afu Afrofuturity is another one. Uh, Black Panther, Wakanda, you know, the city of Wakanda. Where um, it's, it's called a past future representation, a self-representation of what they think that city is. Embedded with all the value systems of that people. And so their value systems were, they were very high tech. Um, they were very communal. They were very ethical. And so that, I think I test my students, and we talk a lot about futurity. If there wasn't the colonial project, and if we weren't interrupted for 150 years, what would that city look like? And I'll sometimes ask my clients that as well. It's hard. When, they, when you get, <laughs> as you get older in age, you get less kind of open, but the students can really get behind this notion of futurity to rethink, you know? And so I think that's what it would be. It would be more connected in all aspects. Yeah, that's I think one of the most beautiful things about indigenous futures is I, you know, and I miss it because it's all this big collective of people and ideas just there. Kind of segueing off that a little bit, um, this idea of like reciprocity, like what does that look like in our built environments, and like how can we build cities in a way that's like giving more back to the land, to the people. Yeah, that, and that's such a good question because it's, I, you know, I created something called the placekeeping framework for architecture and one of the four tenets is reciprocity. And it was something that I would train my staff and my researchers in that if we can't define why this is useful to the home community, you have to redo. You have to be able to articulate it. And what we did is we actually, um, every tribal leader is under the gun on about six different areas, housing, money, infrastructure, um, you know, there, there's a number of issues. And I, we used to, I used to say, how can we help on any of those issues with this project? How can this project tie into what keeps that chief up at night to try and lead his people? And that's, you know, one way of there's possibility. When I think of that in a city context, you know, I think in the project that I'm doing up in Calgary now, if everyone in that city in Calgary, Alberta, understood the assets and the resources that are tied to our indigenous people, gosh, that would be res res reciprocal, right? That would be a beautiful act of reciprocity. If their identity was embedded somehow in a, in a meaningful way, you know, not the kind of symbols on a highway kind of stuff, but in a truly meaningful way, that would be reciprocity. And then finally, if they had, if we had spaces to practice our life ways, for powwows and gatherings and feasts and round dances, and we could invite all of you city dwellers to come and join us, I think that would be reciprocity. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I want to thank you so much for this beautiful talk. It was really, really inspiring and also hopeful. So I want to thank you for the hopeful faith on the discipline of architecture. I have a question for you. When, we, when you went over the, the different principles, I was thinking a lot of them seem to be going beyond design, at least to me, and include actually, actually include program. And I wonder what's your role and your experience as a designer negotiating when you have to adapt not just design, but adapt more than the design and the program and have these difficult conversations with clients and leaders. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, the, the act of trying to productively disrupt architecture is not only just aesthetics, it's also the program. Right, because we have different life ways, we use space differently, and sometimes I can't fit it into a typical space. And so you have to reprogram it, and then you have to also poke at the indigenous community and ask them to kind of abandon their colonial, you know, the brainwashing that has, it influences all of us, right? To kind of release them. 
and which is why I connect to indigenous futurity so much because I try and make them you know imagine that that didn't happen the colonial project didn't happen but it's such a hard conversation but what we're really trying to get to is creating different spaces you know what um, we were doing the Calgary project downtown and she said if we're going to go in and do an indigenous the theatrical dance well I need a cup of tea that's our norm is to have a cup of tea before and I was like why do we need a Starbucks at the front of this theater? It should be an indigenous tea house and we're going to grow the plants outside in the yard and we're going to make tea from it and everyone is going to have an indigenized cup of tea in an indigenized tea house before we go and see the performance. So it is about the program, but oh, it's hard work. It is, because we're all kind of, it's easier to just copy something that's been done a hundred times, right? And to kind of invent how to reprogram spaces can be hard, and we, I'm, we're probably going to fail a hundred times in the next 50 years at, you know, experimenting, and maybe it doesn't work, but in the chance that it does work and it aligns with their worldview and their belief systems, their use, I think it's, it's worth the test. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so sort of bouncing off of that to some extent, I think it's been like a, maybe a semester and a half long conversation that we've been sort of having about like, where does sort of autonomy, like design autonomy, or you know, like this, these moments of you know, maybe intervention, and you know, like you, know, you hit some of these points of you know, retooling, reaggregating, reframing, like these sort of seem like almost subversive methods of, to gain a little bit of autonomy and make sure that like strong design, you know, is able to come through to the, to the end, and strong design that's reflective of a culture or something. But at the same time, it feels like you know, you have that whole process of community feedback. And yeah, you know, there's there's almost like a desire to like give autonomy, right? Yes. Give autonomy to the community and that kind of thing. So could you just like unpack some of that tension and maybe where you sort of fall out on those projects? Yeah, and th I think that you touch on something which is I think one of the hardest things, hardest parts of this work is because it you you are decentered. I am decentered in this work. You know, at the end, I'm hoping we get something nice, but sometimes we're asked to create. A, a donut, and we have we just say okay, we're gonna make the best donut you. <laughs> so, but I think you know who wrote about this, Johanny Plasma. He wrote um, this notion, the duality, where the individual versus the collective, and that I think is a really, really critical distinction with this work. And I think is there an answer? Is there a right answer to this? I, to me, can it be both end? Can we create architecture for that is autonomous and that is you know we enjoy for the beauty and the aesthetics and the art of it, and then can we create something else that is re, re, a response to our collectiveness as human beings, as people, you know, in certain cultures? So to me, I think it can be both end, but they are you cannot mix them together because the way we do it, we give up a lot of autonomy in this work. We do. Yeah, that's, uh, this is, I think there's a whole school that could be based on <laughs> just what you brought up. Question. Yeah, so you briefly mentioned the vitamized scientific standard. Right? So I was wondering what are some good, like, substantial ones that designers should uh, aim to uh, abide by? Did you, well, I missed the word, what standards? Scientific. Oh, scientific standards. You mean from, um, well, for us, I think we right now, and this is a kind of a crazy idea, we are creating a system of, based on, um, there was a definition of indigenous architecture, the second one there, and we now have started a massive mural board where we are putting vignettes attached to every one of those seven principles to really get to the principles or the tenets of what indigenous architecture could connect to. And we're hoping it's kind of like an encyclopedia. It might be a bit scientific, but it would be, um, it's almost like when we just started this project this in the last couple of weeks, it would almost be like a, tracing the patterns in indigenous architecture through little vignettes and organized according to Matunga's theory. And, and will it go somewhere? I hope so, but this is the science that we're trying to put behind it. The other thing that we're doing in terms of science is we've started um, the data visualization tool. Has anyone ever heard of Visual Cinnamon? God, Google her work. 
she's in Rotterdam or Amsterdam or something, but she's a data um, science visualization expert, and her work is just stunning. Google the UNESCO project, and she took, what she was trying to do is to make culture visible. And so she took every aspect that could be made visible of culture, she has nothing to do with architecture, but she brought it together in this beautiful, the most beautiful interactive diagrams, which is about kind of making things visible. And I think that would also help define the sort of science behind this work. Great question. Yeah, visual cinema in UNESCO. We should be teaching that. Right, how to make culture visible. Sorry, not <laughs> Maybe along those lines, I, I just have a question about the formats of research. Um, when you engage communities and collect information and collect stories, um, what, how do you do that and through what, through what means? Like text and recordings and video and, and have you tried to expand on those formats? Yeah, and it's tricky because we intersect always with traditional knowledge and it's protected. So we have had a really challenging time, you know, because a lot, and there's a lot of mistrust in our Indigenous communities. They don't want to be recorded, you, you know, and, and I, can, I can get their point. And so we have to do a lot, of, um, a lot of trust building at the beginning to be able to record. But what I have learned over the past 25 years is to type like a beast. <laughs> I sit in a meeting and I can literally transcribe four hours of community engagement word for word these days. And it's just for the, for the times when they just do not want to be recorded, I transcribe. And now we're teaching all of our researchers to also take typing skills <laughs> in classes so that they can type. But now with Zoom, we are recording a lot of things, but we uh, make sure that we have everyone sign an agreement that all of those recordings are given back to the community, right? Because it's their cultural knowledge. And I said, I'm going to take pieces of it, and I'm going to use it in these ways, A, B, and C, and then I'm going to give you back the data because it belongs to you and not me. So I think this is a really important, um, really important aspect of this work, is how we record the voices from community. Yeah. Same question. Does that extend to the representation of the project? To the representation of the project? Like the like the final renderings and yeah, like, is that a system of recording? Yeah, I mean, I guess th those we haven't those have we've been we haven't been covering that up, but there are aspects from some of the projects that we don't show the world. You know, there's some ceremonial rooms, and they have all. There was one room I designed. There were markings all over the floor. And I was drawing it up with an L Blackfoot elder, and then I said, can you tell me what it means? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, come back when the building's built, and I will teach you what I've inserted on the floor inside. So there are rooms, there are sacred rooms in these buildings that we, yeah, I still have yet to go and have that ceremony in that room. It's just lines on the floor right now. I was just wondering um, if you've ever dealt with or how you deal with uh, indigenous burial sites uh, that are like unmarked, um, which I guess there's still a lot of them left out west. Yeah. There's a lot. And to be honest, the only project that ever I worked on that uncovered a burial site, it fell through. They, not only was there a burial site, but there was an eagle's nest in the tree. And when they cut that tree down, the whole development just went just fell off the rails. And I was like, oh, some, something's at play here larger than, larger than the architecture team. So, but what we normally do, you know, a lot of the artifacts, um, we've been instructed to not touch it, to not even like an arrowhead. I've been out on Navajo Nation and you, there are arrowheads lying literally in the dirt. Um, and you, they've been taught, the kids that we were touring with, they've been taught to just kind of go around them and leave them sitting there. I think this is. I think this is another big area because, as you know, I don't know if it's happening here, but in Canada they keep unearthing all sorts of things in the ground, and um, I think this is going to be an area of exploration that we kind of need to start digging in a little bit and see see the history that lies beneath the surface of our earth. Yeah. 
There was a hand there. I think. I'm, I'm interested in um, how in this this project of this um, kind of generalized universal view of indigenous design um, has moments of uh, like tension and similarities with uh, this also like the locality of indigeneity. Like you're coming from the Santa Lake Cree, like how does that feel to be here in this different uh, network of, of indigenous communities? And like what similarities and differences are you finding in both design principles and just Oh, wow, that's a great question. And I think the one thing one thing I noticed when I first came here, you know, I was so intrigued because it's like the Southwest, and there's so much history in here, and all the old architecture, and oh my God, like I took my students on it. We were doing a Roden Crater studio, and we took the, I took them on this like one week walkabout before we got to the crater, <laughs> and they thought the crater the crater they were like. <laughs> we we love kind of what we saw out there because I took them on the top of the you know the Hopi mesas and and it was my fascination with the Southwest that sort of drove that. Um, but I think what's most important in terms of similarities, I think they have a very similar worldview in terms of the sort of relationality or interconnectedness of all living things. So there's an affinity there. But the beautiful part about being an outsider is I can you know that sort of. Um, the ignorance that we come to an area with and the excitement to actually serve me well because I was so curious about this place and I would ask the silliest questions and people were like, oh, God, here comes that girl again. <laughs> <laughs> Asking all these questions and, you know, but I just wanted to know. And so I think they've been really um, generous and open with me, but I think it's being an outsider is actually a benefit because when I go back home to my community, would I have done this if I was back home in Alberta and with the satellite Cree Nation? I would have been almost kind of shy or, you know, embarrassed to be just digging around, <laughs> asking all the elders all these questions. But here, that curiosity actually fueled a lot, so it actually worked in in a good way. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming tonight. It's been such a great conversation and that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions, everyone. <laughs> right? Yeah, I can stop this recording. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I wasn't able to actually